Welcome back to the third season of Let's Talk Value. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome a true expert in the field of medicine and healthcare and collaboration, Professor Dr. Gilles Salle. Bonjour. Bonjour. Good morning, Verena. Very nice uh, uh, meeting you today. So, as a reminder, my name is Verena Volter. I'm the CEO of 5P Healthcare Solutions and the author of It Takes Five to Tango in Healthcare. How can we move from competition to cooperation and break down silos and get hold of increasing cost and decreasing quality and care and overall better satisfaction for everybody? We have an issue of doctor burnout, and nurses burnout. And if you talk about healthcare, everybody seems to have their set of frustrations. In my observation, after 25 years in healthcare, working both in pharma and in the clinics and negotiating with payers and governments, my observation is we have a strong purpose, strong common purpose in healthcare, and that should unite us. That should help us to build bridges and break down silos. So in a few words, Gilles Salle doesn't need a lot of introduction, but I think there's a few people maybe outside of medicine and, and maybe cancer care who still will discover you, Gilles. So Gilles Salle is a hematologist from France and has been the past president of one of the really leading academic study groups in the world living and breathing collaboration across industry and academ academia for the benefit of better patient care in the set of lymphoma. And today, and, and that study group, by the way, was DELISA, the, the lymphoma study group uh, of adult patients in France, but really running worldwide clinical trials. And that is a lot of, to the credit of Gilles and his collaborators and colleagues in France who were very visionary to build bridges across the world. And today, he is the division chief of the lymphoma uh, department at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. And now I've talked too much. So I'll move it over. Gilles, first question, the audience always is eager to hear. What does actually value mean to you in medicine and in healthcare? Well, thank you for having me again, Verena. Um, value is really what we offer and bring to our patients. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm a physician, so my dedication to all the things I do is really to try to cure more patients and to see more patients cured or to see more patients alive and without treatment sequela, without side effect and to bring them the best quality of life they can have. And even I will say, if unfortunately, we fail to cure some patients, offer them what we can do the best also during uh, uh, the journey uh, 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 with their cancer. So the value is really, what do we bring to patients? And to me, that's, that's the most important. And uh, we can do that alone as physician, and that's probably the reason I'm here. Uh, but yeah, the end point should be clear. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for being kind of so specific. Somehow it's kind of very simple, right? It's like, that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. So now we also know in daily life, unfortunately, our lives are not always that easy and there seem to be barriers and hurdles all the way. So what, what comes to your mind, like what gets in the way to consistently be able to deliver that value um, to patients? What is like in you, maybe in your, even in your day job as a clinician, but also obviously in all your research activities and your interactions, what are, what are some of the, 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 the hurdles you're facing? Or are there none um, and you figured it out and then you'll tell us the secret cells? <laughs> no, well, well let, let me, um take advantage of having work on both sides of the Atlantic and uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, mm -hmm. uh, an environment and have it discover the US environment right now. Um, I, I think one of the um, important buyer here in the uh, uh, healthcare and uh, how we uh, uh, try to meet these goals and really increase the value of what we do is the um, organization of insurance and payers. And, you know, we are dealing with so many stakeholders in this field, having um, different reactivity, different options, different 
considerations regarding what's the appropriate coverage for patient. Why are they covered in this hospital and not in that one? Why we will have to discuss um, this particular treatment for this particular patient? And well, I was coming from a place where, you know, there were the general authorization which had some restrictions, which I will say were um, pertinent or not. And, and I won't say that everything is uh, 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 green in Europe and, and there are also some access to innovations that is mm -hmm. delayed sometime in Europe. But at the same time, when that was settled, I will say offering to patients the best care we can offer was not an issue. Um, I, I feel that here, the burden of having to deal with um, not only the financial cost for them, but also the um, different administrative and, and uh, uh, organizational layers regarding the cost of care is, is really something that probably, uh, first of all, uh, unfortunately prevent a few patients to access to optimal care. And that's a serious concern. And I won't to go into the debate about that in the uh, uh, US environment and politics, but I think there are unfortunately uh, significant categories of the population that don't have access. But even for those that have access, a significant um, delays and uh, hurdle to organize things in a more simple way. And in addition to that, that brings a lot of people that have to work on that, that lead mm -hmm. on that, and that's mm -hmm. fine. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think simplification of some of the mm -hmm. process will probably Excellent. also diminish some cost in the healthcare. Excellent. And I think uh, it's probably not the topic necessarily for today, but I think in the simplification, the digitalization obviously is also a big help, you know, to get just easy transfer and analytics of data and, you know, not shipping fax machines and stuff like that. So, but I think, I think you're not alone. Unfortunately, many people on this podium, one of the first hurdles they mention is the access and is the payer. And this is not to obviously single out people because that is really what 5p and let's talk value podcast is about is not re-emphasizing and repeating singling out villains and things like that it's just kind of naming the facts and i think for any uh people who want to read up more details i invite them to have a look into the tango for five book there's a deep analytic analytics about the data and the numbers where does all the money sit in the healthcare system and just because we talk on the example of the us has an annual healthcare budget of actually full trillion US dollars today, which is like, you can't even count all the zeros. And then there's data that say that up to 50% of one healthcare dollar, and that's true for a Euro or a Swiss franc, just the same way is actually wasted. And I think that's what one example you're alluding to is like in that value chain, there's all this money that disappears for zillion reasons, bureaucracy, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but we have to state the problem. And I think we have to work on it. Some of it is also human uh, behavior. And I want to maybe it's a segue to talk about obviously you in terms of the drug development cycle have worked a ton and made your career on developing new innovative care for cancer patients who otherwise would be succumbing to their disease, you know, right away. So you have really contributed with the groups to substantially prolong survival with excellent quality of care, some of the treatments you've developed. So talk to us a little bit because that's complex as well, right? Like running clinical trials across ge geographies, getting you know the FDA, the EMA agree to. Um, so maybe there's a few consortia you have worked on. Obviously, one that we both worked on, the Flash one, where even you know Mayo Clinic and FDA and other people were involved. What is your learning that you would like to tell people who embark on consortium working? What helps to actually make those collaborations successful? Yes. What should people watch out for? Yes. That's a very interesting question. And I think um, there are uh, different level of expectation by different people. Regarding colleagues from academia, I will say, and this could be true at the level of um, service, like the Informa service, I have the privilege to chair here at the level of an institution or at the level of 
collaboration across institutions, whether they are national or international. What, what is really important is to figure out that the actions that will be taken by a consortium of people which have defined common goals clearly will be always superior to the, the result of this action will be always superior to the actions that each individual will bring. And that's a value of collaboration, basically. Uh, but it's not one plus one equal two, it's one plus one equal three, four. And you, know, you can add on on that and bringing people together to elaborate goals, to define goals, and to define the way to achieve these goals is efficient and brings value. Um, I insisted uh, uh, clearly regarding the expectations. Um, the expectation is not I take and um, I take what I need and the other one will do the rest. It's really collaboration. I bring things on the table, others bring things on the table. I respect what they bring. I respect their opinion. We get to common grounds. And then when we have defined a goal on which we agree, we move forward together. So there is a time within any consortium of clear definition of the objectives. Um, the second thing regarding collaboration and that extend uh, 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 beside or beyond, sorry, academia. And it's the same when you collaborate with industry for me. You have to know what are your goals as a physician working in academia and what are the goals of industry. And you know, we have different goals in general. I mean, as physician, our main uh, our goal is to provide care to patient and to cure more patient. Industry is still a business and has to bring a, a, a value in their product. Well, we have still a good intersection, which is the fact that when they have good products, and many of them have, uh, that brings bring value and we have a good intersection. But we should not um, be idealistic thinking that we have exactly the same interest. The interests are shared, some are shared, not all are shared. But again, you should keep that in mind. And this is very important in the discussion. And whether you discuss of a project, what are the uh, patients that will be uh, as the optimal patients that should receive this treatment, where this treatment should be developed, how it should be developed, whether it should be um, for a limited time, for a prolonged time, whether you want to work the dose to avoid toxicities and things like that. There may be area where there is a little bit of friction, but just recognizing that all goals uh, have a common uh, value, which is basically benefiting uh, uh, offering patient to benefit to that, but may have behind a little bit different uh, uh, initial interest has to be kept in mind. Just, you know, it, it, it helps to have that in mind and avoid any, you know, conflict. Yes, we just need to recognize that uh, uh, we can share projects, but for, at the end, maybe different interest. Um, I will say, if you have that in mind, um, I think it should work. And uh, as we said, a couple of projects we have been carried on and in which I have been involved have been successful. And I will say it's still probably one of my idea and, uh, and um, basis, baseline when I continue to work with collaborators with industry, which I do routinely. That's not a question, but you know, just keep in mind what we are aiming for and how we are aiming for uh, 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 our goals. And um, I think that uh, avoid misunderstanding. Brilliantly summarized, really. I think uh, nothing to add, it's, it's great. We know that in practice, it's hard. Sometimes the conflict and the, the, the opposing interests or diverging interests sometimes are hard to bridge. But I think what's really helpful is just to re-align on the common purpose, objective, why are we here? So what I'm interested to hear from you also is at the end, there are human beings in the room. And I'm always saying there's nothing like the FDA and there's nothing like 
the Lisa or the Gela or the pair. It's Professor Gilles Zal, there's Raina Volter and many, many others that sit in the room. So any, any recommendation also around maybe the connotation of leadership and like if you reflect on the successful projects, yes, some from a process perspective, you describe very well what's the ingredients to success, like the human connotation. And like, if you think about the people with whom you have been doing it, what comes to mind to recommend like for everybody also on their own skills to work on in terms of, because it takes people who strike a deal and who lead through conflict. Uh, any things you want to share here? What of people well, who have well, stri well, strike you as I, leaders? I, I, I think there is a couple of things common sense, such as, I mean, professional respect, mutual respect. Um, I think we are living in a very specific situation since two and a half years which is a virtual situation. And mm -hmm. I will say that this has significantly hampered the mm -hmm. way we used to work because with the most professional behavior, with the most, um, um, you know, even in situation of potential conflict or divergent interest, still seeing a person face to face, being in the same room, um, shaking hands before at the end uh, brings a little addition that virtual communication is unable to provide. And, and I think uh, uh, we need to get back together. We need to work on sites for people that uh, work remotely. They should make the effort to come back to work. Uh, we need to go back to meetings. We need to go back to places where we sit in the same room. We look together at data and uh, even if we have divergent uh, point of view, uh, exposing and discussing this point of view uh, in person, I will say brings value. So, um, it, you know- Great reminder. We, we are humans and uh, reacting as humans is extremely important as you just mentioned. And uh, um, the experience that we had in the last uh, uh, two years and a half really emphasizes this mm -hmm. need uh, uh, to my point of view. Yeah, and I think obviously you started out with saying it's common sense, so that is the common sense part, but I think it is so particularly important in the context of what we're talking here, bridging silos across the five Ps, and you mentioned like one key success is to always concentrate on the expectations, be clear and specific, and bridge diverging interests, and that simply cannot be done over an email, it's very hard to do that over a Zoom or whatever platform call and video conferencing virtually. When the discussions get heated on around finding that common ground around the interests, thank you for that reminder that sometimes you have to take a plane or you have to take your car or a train and go there and meet the people and sit in the room. And that's how you make progress. It's probably very hard to work through diverging interests in a remote setting. So. Thank you for that call for action and reminder. So uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the time. It's always too short. <laughs> In the beginning, you think like, okay, 20 minutes, what do we talk about? And then all of a sudden we're at 20 minutes. So I think there's so much more to say, but thank you for sharing some a uh, couple of pieces of your experience uh, having been successful in the, in the collaboration table. Anything else? At the end, do you want to leave the audience with as a word of encouragement or sharing on continuing to make progress on innovation in healthcare? Well, I, I think we um, have also experienced in the last five, 10 years in the field in which I'm working of fantastic successes. I mean, I was reviewing uh, uh, recently the number of new drugs being approved for patients with different kind of lymphoma, not even taking into consideration CLL, um, we have almost 20 agents or 20 indications in like three years or four years. So that's phenomenal. And I think this is a result of science. Um, we have learned, um, for instance, so much how CAR T were progressively uh, thought about, discovered, engineered, manufactured, uh, and brought to the patient. Uh, there is science in identifying 
uh, 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 different subpopulation or different entities of lymphoma and describing better some subgroup that may or not benefit for uh, a given therapy. And we have seen that recently with, for instance, BTK inhibitors in DLBCL. So I, I think uh, uh, science is bringing uh, 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 progress. Uh, working together is bringing another progress, continuing to develop that. We have to be very wise because the landscape is even more complex than ever. But at the same time, uh, having brought that to the patient and seen progressively that we are achieving what we aim for, what is the real value, which is curing more patients, uh, is really a satisfaction. So if I have something to share is that um, uh, all of these uh, uh, so-called five Ps that you mentioned should be proud of what we have achieved. And we should really take the lessons from how it has been achieved to continue to move forward. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Gilles Sal. Thank you.